It, it is so exciting to be here with all of you. And I know in this room we have sort of a skewed sample. I, I want to do a brief survey. How, how many of you, and I need a moment of transparency and vulnerability, how many of you would say, I am a creative genius? Just sort of hold up your hand. Okay, we have a, a lot of people in the front row. All right, there's a lot of self-efficacy way up here. All right, but still that's maybe 1% of 1% of 1%. All right, we didn't do well, let's try something else. How many here would say that you are a linguistic savant? <laughs> linguistic savant, if you're not sure what savant means, the last one doesn't apply to you either. <laughs> All right, and <laughs> linguistic savant, raise your hand. I, I can't see hands, I'm sure there's some. Okay, we're not doing well. Uh, all right, so how many of you here would say, I understand English? I want to give you a win. All right, so everyone, except I'm going to come to a pretty quick conclusion here. That those of you who raised your hand, I can speak English, did not learn English when you achieved your PhD or finished your master's degree or when you finally received your BA or went to high school that you learned English when you were around two years old. You were learning one of the most difficult languages in the world before you could walk, before you could talk, before you could feed yourself, change yourself, before you had any genuine value to society, before you could hold a job, before you were bringing in income, you were learning one of the most difficult languages in the world. And if they had moved you from wherever you lived, to Tokyo, you would have learned Japanese at the age of two. They'd moved you to the Philippines, you would have learned Tagalog. If they'd moved you to Venezuela, you would have learned Spanish. If they had moved you to England, you would have finally learned English. <laughs> and yet somehow you've convinced yourself that you are not a linguistic savant, except what would you call someone that at the age of two could be moved anywhere in the world and learn the most complex languages on the planet? If they'd moved you somewhere in Africa, you would have learned a clicking language, and I hope I did not say anything offensive. But, <laughs> but if you were also a linguistic savant, then is it possible you were also a creative genius? That when you were two years old, you were a creative genius, equally as you were a linguistic savant, but somewhere along the way, that genius inside of you that creativity inside of you, that capacity inside of you, instead of being awakened and optimized, was actually beaten away and lost. Years ago, I began asking myself this question. What makes us uniquely human? See, some people have been entrusted with the great burden of great talent. I was not cursed with that. There are some people who, at the age of five, become world-class violinists. There are those who, by the age of eight, are clearly at a world-class level in understanding of physics and mathematics. There are those of you here that you always knew what you were going to do because you were so talented that it was clear that one day you would be a surgeon, one day you would be a teacher, one day you would be a dancer, one day you would be an artist. For me, even being a human was a challenge. I remember when I was 12 years old, I walked into our living room and my mom was talking to my stepdad and they were talking about me. And when they saw me, they, they called me in close and they said, sweetie, we'd like to send you to a psychiatrist. <laughs> now when they said that, I started screaming. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. And at the age of 12, I had a moment of self-awareness. And I realized I look absolutely crazy. And so I stopped and they were trying to pull back and tell me I didn't have to go. They were just trying to help me. And I, I said, okay, I, I wanna go. I wanna go because if I'm crazy, I wanna know. But isn't that the catch 22? <laughs> that if you are crazy, you just, do you really ever know? See, for some people, they cannot figure out what they're going to do when they grow up. They cannot figure out what their unique talent is, what their particular greatness is. But for me, even being human was a challenge. And I didn't know this at 12, that we're that one unique species that doesn't seem to know how to be human, even though that's the only species we are. Isn't it odd 
that humans go to therapy to figure out what it means to be human, how to do human well. I just don't think there are killer whales going, I don't know, I don't know if I got this right. <laughs> I, I don't think there are giraffes going, have you looked at me? I could be a model, but just a neck model, that's about it, that's all I got. There's no zebra out there going, what am I? What does this mean? Am I black on white, white on black? I don't know. <laughs> but we spend our lives trying to figure out how to do human. And, and if you have a pet, you realize that there are nuances of our humanity in our animals. If you have a dog, you, you, you see loyalty and love, and it reflects human characteristics. If you have a cat, you see disloyalty and indifference, just like you see in humans. We had a squirrel in our backyard, and that squirrel chose to leave its natural essence and choose a life of crime, <laughs> and kept breaking and entering into our house, stealing things that no squirrel with any sense of self-respect would ever steal. And because we do not really believe in capital punishment, we captured our squirrel, put him in a cage, and put him in the witness relocation program. But not after I talked to him and said, what you're doing is wrong, man. Live up to what you're supposed to be as a squirrel. You never have those conversations, and yet we have conversations as humans describing ourselves as being inhumane. We never think of a tiger being inhumane if it rips a gazelle's throat. I remember putting my children watching National Geographic so we could watch something wholesome and healthy. And we saw all these baby elephants roaming across the prairie, and then all of a sudden, these baby lions came after them. You could hear this really elegant sort of NPR voice saying, and the baby lion cubs <laughs> have to refine their hunting skills on baby elephants, though their claws are not yet capable of breaking through the strong elephant hide. And my children are freaking out, going, what is going on? I had to change the channel to HBO to watch something that wasn't as violent. And, <laughs> And yet we never put that classification on any other species. Do you know why? It's because we humans have this unique capacity to imagine ourselves different than we are, better than we are. See, we humans have this unique gift known as the imagination. And I am convinced that what makes us uniquely humans is that we materialize the invisible. Doesn't that sound like a superpower? If you were a human being, you have the capacity, in fact, this is an inherent nature of being human. You materialize the invisible on an ongoing, regular basis, even though you may not realize it. See, as a human being, you imagine a world that does not exist. You imagine a future that has not been created. You imagine a life you've never lived. You imagine a self you have never become. And that imagination that we call ideals drives us. Sometimes they haunt us and taunt us, but they always woo us and call us, which is why the imagination is both a curse and a gift. Some of you know your imagination has been a curse. When you imagine yourself better than you are, when you imagine your life better than it is, when you imagine the world better than where you know it to be, it can become an incredible curse to all of us. There are some of us here that have been paralyzed because of our imagination. We've been lost in our darkest imagination. And I want to assure you, there is no creature on this planet having a crisis of imagination like a human being does. There's no gazelle saying, can't you see it? The routine, the redundancy, the monotony of life. We've sold out, man. We're, we're trapped. The man has taken over. We need to rage against the machine. We get up. We eat grass. We hear the roar. We run. <laughs> we don't look back. You don't look back, man. <laughs> we pretend no one's missing. <laughs> we eat a little more grass. We drink some water. Next day, repeat. Wouldn't it be great if some antelope got up and said, I'm done. I'm done being the hunted. From now on, I'm the hunter. I'm going after a lion. Who's going with me? <laughs> it would be a one-day career. Whoa. <laughs> he was good at catching that lion. And yet you will live your life always haunted by a sense of more. 
of, of wondering if you've lived the life you were created to live, if you've ever stepped into the full potential of who you are as a human being. I, I think names are amazing. I, there are people whose names are like farmer and, and carpenter and smith, and you have those names because somewhere in your history, you had a great, 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 great grandfather who was a carpenter, and his son was a carpenter, and his son was a carpenter, and you had some ancestor who was a farmer, and his son was a farmer, and his family were farmers, and you have some ancestor that, that, that was a blacksmith, and so you had smiths from smith to smith. See, if beavers had last names, they would be damn. <laughs> you see, if you were a beaver, you would have one career option. You would be building a dam for the rest of your life. But because you're human, you can have the name farmer and become an architect. You can have the name carpenter. You can become a dancer. You can have the name smith and become an engineer because humans can reimagine who they are and create a future that does not yet exist. See, we live in the world of ideas and dreams and visions and thoughts. We are talking about a future that does not yet exist. And really, if anyone should be meeting about climate change, it should be polar bears and penguins, but they do not have the foresight or the personal responsibility to do something about the problems in the world. <laughs> but we can see where this is going, and so we need to do something about it. I was in a conversation in Rio de Janeiro at TED, and one of my friends who invited me to Hong Kong came and said, what we really need is the highest level of human consciousness. We need the elimination of all thought. I said, when you said the elimination of all thought, do you also mean the imagination? He said, absolutely, we need to eliminate the imagination. He goes, but not only that, we need to eliminate all feeling. So said, now when you're saying, let's eliminate all feeling, do you also include love? He goes, absolutely, we need to eliminate all love, all thought and all feeling. I said, no, I, I, maybe I'm missing something here. But if you give me love and imagination, I can change the world. See, I am convinced that what we as humans bring that is different than every other species on this planet is in the same way that bees create hives and ants create colonies, humans create futures. And what we oftentimes underestimate is the human capacity to create a future that the world desperately needs. You see, evil men do not wait for permission to create what they imagine. But good people keep responding to the future as if we have no control over what's coming into the human story. We need to realize that it's time for us to embrace our responsibility that we have been imagined to imagine, created to create, and that we are all works of art and artists at work, and that there is no question whether we will create. The only question is what will we create? There are some of you here who are haunted by your imagination. You imagine a world without poverty. You are haunted by your imagination. You imagine a world without injustice. You are haunted by your imagination. You are, are haunted by an imagination of a world with peace, without violence, with equality, with economic prosperity for everyone. You imagine a world where we take social responsibility and environmental responsibility. You imagine a world that has never been known, has never been experienced, has never been created. But you know that it's more important to imagine and create than to reflect and regret. The question is not whether we can create or whether we will create, but what kind of future? Will we create?